Okay, fasten your seatbelt, Novel Therapies Part 1. So you're stuck with me for this talk and the next, and I'm going to try to go through what do we have that's new and exciting in AML, and in particular for those of you who were here last year, what can I add to the discussion that we started last year at this meeting? These are my disclosures, which are also found in your um, various apps. Okay, so looking at SEER 2000 and AML statistics, we're not where we want to be, but we are getting a little bit better. So it's still a reasonably rare disease, although certainly not on my service. The percent five, uh, surviving at five years is still around 28%. So that is very much not where we want to be. But if you look at the little green carrots, they are moving in the right direction. Historically, that movement in the right direction has been attributed primarily to successful supportive care measures, in particular azole antifungals. But actually, now we are hoping hoping that that needle is being moved and will be moved more robustly with actually AML-directed therapies. And here, if you look at 2017 to 19, these are US drug approvals. For my European colleagues, the conversations are different. And there's certainly, there are access issues um, that are evolving in Europe and in the rest of the world. But here, if you look at the quote unquote targeted therapies, mitostorin, CPX, enosidinib, gemtuzumab, we're going to discuss all of these. I call your attention to, first of all, the number after many years of having had nothing approved at AML, and secondly, a target. So what is a target in AML? A target isn't necessarily a mutation. It's not necessarily a CD. CD33 is a target, but target can be loosely defined. It can be a pathway. It can be a mutation, something that we're shooting for in hitting the disease. And we'll go over why that's important in terms of designing therapy. Wow, that's a lot of music. You guys, are. I wish I had a water gun. Um, okay, standard seven and three has been beaten in four randomized trials. So the addition of mitostorin in comparison to CPX351 by the addition of gemtuzumab and especially since my esteemed Polish colleagues are in the audience by the addition of cladribine by the Polish Acute Leukemia Study Group. So you need to think about it. The board's answer of seven and three isn't right anymore. There are other things that we can do and it's very important to be quite adept in figuring out which regimen you want to give your patient that isn't just seven and three. So looking at gemtuzumab, so CD33 is the target, a target that I just mentioned. CD33 is expressed on the majority of myeloid blasts and has been an attractive target in AML for decades. Um, this drug actually is a conjugated antibody to the chemotherapy colichiomycin and the and the goal here is that the uh, gemtuzumab recognizes the CD33 expression on AML cells and then blows it up by launching the colichiomycin. And this drug is now approved for newly diagnosed CD33 positive AML um, in combination with chemotherapy, and also um, it's it's also approved. Um, in uh, uh, relapse and refractory disease. So the drug was approved a while ago, it went off the market, and now it came back again. So where do we use it? If you look at the design of the um, uh, alpha trial from France, this is a phase three study that randomized standard seven and three to seven and three plus the addition of gemtuzumab. It's important to note that this is a fractionated and lower dose schedule than what people were familiar with with the original approval. And here the, you can see the schema of the trial and basically it included patients from 50 to 70 years old with de novo AML, a very classic randomization, 7 and 3 versus 7 and 3 plus GO, with doses of 7 and 3 that everybody would find more or less acceptable. People argue forever about the dose of anthracycline, but here it was 60 per meter squared times 3 of donorubicin with 200 per meter squared of cytarabine for 7 days. Here is the money shot, which is event-free survival that was improved with the addition of gemtuzumab. Couple of important things about this. First of all, you're seeing event-free survival. That was a new thing in acute leukemia. So in AML, historically, overall survival has been the only thing that quote unquote counted for regulatory approvals. Here, uh, event-free survival held the day. And what you can see that the median time to event in months was increased substantially. We are still talking talking about a disease with survival measured in months, so we have a lot of work to do, but this represented um 
a, uh, a clear improvement. If you look here, though, what's interesting is that the overall responses, if you look at the CRs and the CRPs, were not necessarily that different. So what we're getting is a, uh, a benefit in event-free survival without necessarily seeing a difference in CRs, and there are various reasons why that might be the case. Certainly, the ability to put patients into a deeper MRD negative response, which we'll talk about later, is implicated as a reason for why certain trials may not make CR better right away, but may make survival better at a later time point in measurement. Now, here, MRD was not measured in this particular trial, by the way, so that's a hypothesis. Looking at safety, there were increased rates of hemorrhage with the gemtuzumab arm, but this did not result in an increase in early mortality, and there was VOD. VOD is a serious complication that has been noted in, um, uh, in the use of gemtuzumab. There were episodes, but the question is, is it really more than in the control arm, and does it affect patients who would be going on to stem cell transplant? It looks like the lower and fractionated dosing schedule is probably mitigating for that, but still a complication that needs to be watched, especially for patients um, who have pre-existing uh, disease that may be um, predisposing. If you look at the subgroups, gemtuzumab was favored in all of the subgroups except with unfavorable cytogenetics. This group was not specifically excluded from the label because many places still take a long time to get back their cytogenetics. and didn't want anybody to be denied access to the drug because their cytogenetics were taking two weeks to come back. But if you look at slightly older, slightly younger, performance status, white count, FLT3, all of these look like they were favoring the, um, the addition of gemtuzumab. So where do you actually use the drug? Where is it most powerful? I think the most obvious application of this as standard of care is in core binding factor AML. So patients with inversion 16 and 821 have the most dramatic benefits in overall survival with the addition of gemtuzumab. These data, which all you need to look at from a distance is not the little tiny letters. You just can look at the distribution on the forest plot and also the separation of the curves. So here, for the favorable risk cytogenetics, the absolute benefit is 20% plus at six years. This was analyzed in an important meta-analysis and actually was a lot of the driver for why the academic community wanted gemtuzumab to come back into play. So it is the standard of care in addition to chemotherapy for patients with core binding factor AML. Moving on to other targets, looking at mitostorin. So mitostorin is a uh, potent FLT3 ITD and TKD inhibitor, but it's not actually completely specific for FLT3. It actually inhibits VEGF, PKC, KIT, PDGFR, and part of that quote unquote dirty inhibition, so there are FLT3 and other inhibitors that are referred to as more selective or more dirty in their pattern of inhibition. Here, this might be important. It might be that this inhibition of other pathways is actually significant in the activity of the drug. FLT3 ITD in younger patients is um, uh, felt to confer a the highly proliferative disease and a poor prognosis, and this drug is indicated in newly diagnosed patients with a FLT3 mutation. This approval was based on the phase three RATIFY trial. So RATIFY was, again, a fairly straightforward randomized trial of seven and three versus seven and three plus mitostorin. This is newly diagnosed patients ages 18 to 60, so note the ages. There was a stratification by TKD and by ITD, which are um, two forms of the FLT3 mutation that we see, and also by allelic ratio. Straightforward randomization, but not a straightforward trial to conduct at all, because it took, you can see, multiple participating groups and a lot of years to get these data, because many patients are taken off of the trial to go on to stem cell transplant, and the statistics were actually complicated to try to figure out what the exact benefit was of the addition of the investigational agent, given that many of the patients were going on to transplant. So if you look at the complete response rates here, again, mitostorin versus placebo, if you look at CR by day 60, actually here again, the responses, the CRs weren't particularly different in the mitostorin arm. If you look a little bit later on, it actually turns into a significant benefit um, in uh, CR looking 
in induction and consolidation. And here also the point is timing of the assessment. When exactly are you looking? Or if you're checking responses at exactly day 28 or day 30, perhaps the platelets haven't fully recovered yet and you're not designating a complete response. But here too, I think that the main thing was also not so much the um, initial response benefit, but the overall survival response benefit. You can see mitostorin on top versus the placebo. There was a um, clear advantage in uh, median overall survival that resulted in the, um, the FDA approval of the drug. Now, if you look at the toxicity, people always want to know, well, there's a survival benefit, but you know those curves aren't separated by three inches on the screen. Is there a significant toxicity from adding the drug? And actually, there isn't. It is generally well tolerated. There is some GI toxicity. There is some rash to look out for. And patients don't enjoy the way the drug tastes. But I think that, in general, this is a very manageable toxicity profile that does not result in many discontinuations, and this has become the standard of care for these patients. I thought I would just introduce you for one second to this study, which was from um the German groups showing that mitostorin added to chemotherapy and then ongoing maintenance um, basically replicated the results of Ratify. And the reason that I'm showing you these data are actually, again, you can look at the um, separation of the curves, that basically you can do this in older patients too. So there were patients up to 70 in this trial, whereas Ratify was only up to 60. So while overall survival in older patients is still lower than it is with younger patients, the addition of mitostorin should be considered standard of care when added to, in uh, addition to chemotherapy for the older patients um, as well. And I think it's helpful to have these uh, additional data. Moving on to uh, secondary AML. So secondary AML is actually a very difficult uh, to treat disease that does in fact carry a worse prognosis than patients with de novo AML. You can look here that for um, de novo in yellow versus um, secondary versus the therapy related in green, there is a significant difference in outcomes. And the biology of these diseases uh, of secondary um, and therapy related AML is just different from what it is for de novo patients. So here we start talking about um, CPX351, which is a donorubicin and cytarabine liposome. This is indicated it is approved for the treatment of adults with newly diagnosed therapy-related uh, AML or AML with uh, myelodysplasia-related changes. The idea here was that the delivery mechanism of the two agents that have given us the most cures in AML over the last decades than anything should be optimized. And what if we put it together in a liposome and optimize drug delivery, could this actually make a difference um, in outcomes? And this was tested in a phase three randomized trial, again, uh, CPX351 versus standard induction. This was tested in patients ages 60 to 75, able to tolerate intensive chemotherapy with a good performance status. And the idea here, again, a pretty straightforward randomization and using a control arm that nobody is going to pick on. It's a very standard um, formulation of uh, seven and three. It just amuses me to note that the cytarabine here is 100 per meter squared times seven instead of 200. I, I think I will surely be long dead and buried before anybody decides which one is better, 100 or 200 of cytarabine, and I don't care. They both work, and I think it's reasonable to use this as a um, as a control arm. And what you can see here is that actually the response rates with the CPX351 look better in this. So you can see CPX is in blue and the um, 7 and 3 is in orange. Both looking at CR and a composite endpoint of CR plus CRI looked better with um, the investigational drug. And here, too, there was an overall survival benefit compared to 7 and 3. So this is interesting. It's a particularly difficult group of patients to treat those who who have um, MDS-related uh, changes and, um, uh, and therapy-related disease are known to be particularly difficult. I think that there is a bunch of theory as to why this would work better for these patients with difficult biology, but we don't fully know the answer yet. Nonetheless, there's a survival benefit here, too. 
Um, and this has become standard for, uh, for this patient population. If you look at the most frequently reported adverse against, uh, events, again, there is definitely prolonged platelet and neutrophil recovery, and you should expect this when you treat the patients, but there isn't an increase um, in early mortality, um, and I think that's important. You do have to be prepared, though, to monitor the patients and treat their cytopenias um, uh, until recovery. Now, if you look over here for the treatment subgroups, so there are lots of patients who get into this. There are older ones, there are unfavorable cytogenetics, there are patients with um, prior therapy with hypomethylators. The basic, again, these are too small to read from a distance, but what you can see Every single subgroup here did actually favor CPX351. But what you still want to think about, and what I think is going to come up um, in the rest of all of our talks, is that if you look at the survivals, the survival benefit is there for both, for, uh, both age groups, for complex cytogenetics, even for patients with prior HMA, the CPX did better. But we are still talking about overall survival measured in months for these groups. And I think that that's the hard part, is that when a patient hears that there's a survival benefit in a novel therapy, I promise you what they are thinking is that they're going to live forever, not that there's going to be a difference in uh, their survival separation by um, short numbers of months. So I think that while th this is definitely an incremental improvement, I'm launching the day by saying that we have plenty still to do in AML because I would love to be talking about this disease with respect to multi-year survival, not months. Now here, I can't resist. Um, I am quoting a maybe new kid on the block. So this is from a press release from September 12th, 2019 that is published. Um, phase three, the so-called Quasar trial um, of uh, CC486, which is oral azacitidine, as a maintenance therapy in patients with newly diagnosed acute myeloid leukemia met its primary and key secondary endpoints. So I have been uh, chairing this trial for many years now. We weren't even sure if it could get done. But as I end the session on intensive inductions, what we're thinking about mostly in AML is getting people into remission and transplanting them. That's not what we're doing for the core binding factor patients. So if you're giving intensive induction with gemtuzumab to a core binding factor patient, you're not anticipating a transplant. But for everybody else that I've been talking about for the last 20 minutes, you're still trying to get that patient to a transplant. And the question is, why can't we use maintenance in AML? Well, the reason is because it's never worked. There's never been an overall survival benefit for maintenance in the same way as there has been for ALL. Well, except now there is. So we are excited to be uh, preparing this for, um, for presentation, hopefully at ASH. This is an uh, international phase three randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study, all the things that you want to see. And it's specifically looking at the safety of oral and efficacy of oral azacitidine in patients with AML who are in remission. So these are people who got intensive chemotherapy who are in remission and the, it showed a highly uh, statistically significant, I can't say anything other than what's in the press release, so my remarks are specifically what is um, public knowledge of uh, statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement in both overall survival and relapse-free survival. So we're hopeful as the data become available and mined that this will add to the conversation of what are the options for intensively treated patients who are hopefully ha having their initial responses deepened by the addition of novel agents, as I've described, might we be able to not stem cell transplant some people in the future? And that is just hypothesis generating, not a suggestion for right now. I would like to acknowledge my um, fantastic, uh, incredible team. Some of the team members are here today, and some you will meet. And I will put up the slide over and over again, because it's impossible to emphasize enough. And that is going to take us to the end of number one.